Leaving my heat side. What I'd like to do is to have each one of you go around the room and tell who you are, tell quickly your ethnic background, and um, it may be what um, you stand or sit or whatever you, sitting is fine or standing okay. or whatever makes sense for you. We'll see. I'll sit. <laughs> I'm not preaching. Um, your insight <clears throat> on the LGBTQ community, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer community, and we'll explain things as we go along. And what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce Reverend Cooper officially online. We're not, we're not taking now. Right? I'll, I'm going to edit this out. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I'm smacking my lips and not ready yet. <laughs> I got to get some lipstick on also. But um, Reverend will talk about faith and health care. She has an example from Blue Cross Blue Shield that she'll use. Then we'll shift over and she'll talk about the LGBTQ community and its impact. She's an active member of that community as a lesbian. And the whole piece about India and all those wonderful scarves that you purchased, they, they bought about $230 worth of product that Good. immediately went to the Theramani village. So we know about India. So my whole fascination with India is because of Reverend Carla Cooper. So she's going to talk to you about that too. So it's going to be an hour at length and um, during that time we'll we'll probably it'll, it'll be about 45 minutes and then we'll leave 15 minutes for Q&A for you. This is going to be edited by Master Kevin here and it'll be available online on the Bristol Community College website that they have. So that's um, that's our format for today in terms of that. Then we'll shift and off camera, I have my, my own camera and I may do some videotaping. We'll just sort of expand the conversation, really specifically talking about women and women's issues, which we began talking about last week. But women in healthcare, we have Reverend Cooper here, she'll have great insight with that. Um, I want to talk about one or two more of your cases that you developed, and that will pretty much be our session for today. This is class eight. We only have two more sessions after this, so next week we'll begin to wrap up the discussion, talk about the remaining number of your cases, and then we go into week 10 where we uh, wrap everything up and eat food. <laughs> week 10 is uh, uh, where you participate fully <laughs> by bringing a dish of your choice. So that's uh, how we're going to have things rock and roll. Want to make sure you got that. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> no, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> This is, when you came in, you saw some of the um, shots from yesterday. We had our Black History slash St. Patrick's Day breakfast, which was a big success. We had about 140 people there, all walks of life, corporate America, nonprofit, uh, educational institutions, faith-based organizations, and uh, Reverend Carla Cooper was our keynote speaker, and it was just fantastic. Uh, this is the program booklet from it. Um, we're probably going to go back to that hotel next year, probably do it in March of next year because February just doesn't like people. <laughs> weather. And um, so we just had a good time. And I'm very grateful that uh, Reverend Carla Cooper was able to come and stay, extend her visit, and also uh, come to class because we like to have live experts to come to class. So this is a great opportunity for us. So I'll introduce her in just a few minutes, but I'd love to, again, go around the room, tell everybody who you are, tell me what you do quickly, and um, your ethnic background, and then the LGBT connection and you. All right. 
So, gems? Who you are, what you I do, am, your ethnic Jen. background, and your connection to the LGBTQ community. Um, I'm Jennifer Landry. I work for Personal Touch on uh, CNA. Um, I am Indian, Portuguese, Irish, and French. Um, I don't know, my, I mean, I think I have patients that are lesbian that I've been in. It doesn't bother me at all. But you have patients who are Yeah, lesbians. I have patients, I have friends. Yeah. I have more fun with them than I do with the street people, but. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 Thank you much. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Ortiz. And I work for Coastline Elderly Services, which is no longer elderly services. We work with everyone. Um, but I work for the Meals on Wheels. Um, I'm Puerto Rican. Was born there and came here when I was 13. Um, with lesbian or gay, or I have no problem. Because I, I do have family members. They don't bother me. I mean, it's, it's human, you know. My name is Ian Giovannini. I also work at Coastline Services. <laughs> I work in the fiscal department on the billing clerk. I was born in St. Michael, I know, Azores, Terceira. I was six when I came to the United States. Um, I love this country. I've been back to visit um, the old country, but it's just not home. The United States is my home. And as far as the list, I have family members who are. Uh, to the preference. Is there any instructions on how to get in or how to go? Hi, I'm Kim Korea. I'm a nurse here at Personal Touch. Um, I'm English, Irish, Polish, and Norwegian. <laughs> and um, I've lived here pretty much. Or, yeah, I've lived here all my life. Um, we have, I guess, uh, my sister's neighbors who are kind of like our or her family they come to all of our family holiday events um and um one of their daughters just married um another female and my nieces all stood up in the wedding and it's yeah it, it's just a no um the kids don't even question anything it's just a natural you know no questions asked really but that's about it okay Hi, I'm my name is Lindsay Arsenal. I um, work with Coastline. I'm one of the registered nurses there. Um, I'm Portuguese, French, Irish, Native American, <laughs> a little bit of everything. Um, but I more, mainly connect with my Portuguese roots, um, especially being in this area. Um, as for the lesbian, gay, transgender community, I have the opportunity to attend UMass Dartmouth, which is um, I was telling um, Carol last week that I noticed when I first went to the university that they they raised the lesbian, gay, transgender flag there, right with the American flag, and I thought that was pretty impressive. And I they have a really big group there, so I had a lot of exposure to maybe where I did it in high school and stuff like that. So college was really eye opening for me. I worked with a lot of colleagues in the HR department and they were also openly gay and it was just a really good environment for me to get more comfortable with all walks of life and everything and everyone's choice in life so it was good and um <laughs> lindsay also knows about the westboro baptist church <laughs> only because um i have there was a marine in my town who passed away in fairhaven recently and they were 
made a thing to protest. They didn't show up. They just, it was all talk. So they were trying to protest. Well, Reverend Cooper will give you an update on what happened yesterday, oh, yeah. two days ago. They did show up. Oh, <laughs> We talked about this last week. So mm, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. My name is Rose Jackson. I work for Personal Touch um, uh, DNA, and I'm Polish and Portuguese. And I do not have any patients that are friends of your uh, gay lesbian, but I do yeah, have I a 12 year old niece that is. And it comes very. So natural to my family, to everybody. I have two small children that don't even question it. They see them together all the time. So that's, um, and I support her 100% on any choice that she makes with her own life and anybody else's. So, thank you. Hi, my name is Suzanne Lamy. I work here at Personal Touch as an aid, and I'm Portuguese, and I really have no connections with all that stuff. I mean, I know of it, mm -hmm. but I don't have any. And I'm good with it. I'm Katie Cardozo. I'm a nurse for personal touch as well as the emergency, one of the local emergency rooms. Um, I am Irish, Native American, and German. I don't really have any cultural connections, though. We're just pretty standard American family. And uh, my connections is family, co-workers, friends, I mean, every, like Lindsay was saying, college was quite the eye-opening experience, but just very, um, very natural and, and very um, opening, and it's no different to me than, than anybody else. Yeah. So we'll start off with just a brief, because I want to spend more time on the LGBT connection and health care. Talk to us first about faith and the workplace. This is what we started off this morning with the other group that we addressed. You're a theologian. You are a chaplain at Doan College. Um, certainly have uh, expanded your reach and your personal touch in terms of faith and values and ethics. Talk to the group here about the importance. We had a very lively conversation last week about religion in the workplace. We also talked in depth about the Jehovah's Witness uh, faith and what their taboos are and what they believe in. So this is something that I think we're realizing is a very much a part of healthcare. We don't talk about it that much. Um, we just make assumptions, but I'm open for you just to uh, put your uh, theological spin on the importance of faith, the healthcare industry, and the workplace. All right, so Reverend Cooper. Sure. Um, you know, there has been um, recent research, and I say recent, probably within the last uh, five to ten years, on how important faith is in terms of healthcare, especially uh, dealing with patients who are in terminal um, illnesses. And, and part of that, and it has really nothing to do basically with a faith tradition or, or, or religious practice, but more so in centering oneself in terms of uh, the energy feel that, um, that prayer and meditation brings into this whole notion of wellness. And so, um, and I have a lot of physicians, medical professionals in my, in my family, and, and one particular relative had shared with me how uh, he said, uh, used to teach at, at Emory, and he, he said that how things have changed so much in terms of part of the requirements to be a physician now is to um, take some spirituality courses as well as cultural competency courses and that wasn't the that wasn't the story you know 15 20 years ago uh, because patients are are, are are and physicians are using more of a holistic approach rather than always a prescriptive approach how can we address wholeness rather than um, uh, finding an, an immediate remedy because sometimes um, healing takes place when there's never a cure 
and healing is as much mental as it is physical as well. So looking at the total body in terms of how that works. And so when we engage in various uh, faith traditions and honoring those faith traditions, many of the questionnaires, and I've done a, a small amount of work in terms of hospice chaplaincy and, 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 and as, a, as a pastor dealing with uh, my parishioners and others who are uh, at various stages in their healthcare journey with, with beginning stages of cancer to all the way uh, seeing it through or other maladies that take place. And one of the uh, questions that are, that's always on the questionnaire when a person is admitted into the hospital is, um, what is your religion? <laughs> and inevitably, I would see that questionnaire filled out uh, as Methodist, or Catholic, or, but that's not a religion, that's a denomination. So Christianity would be the, the religion. Uh, and, and, and that means something because uh, we have such, uh, a religion as a practice. And, and there are people who say they're not religious, everybody has a religion. I religiously, every morning, wake up and wash my face and brush my teeth. <laughs> That's my practice. That's what I do every day. Uh, the avenue of how I use my practice, I use Crest. So Crest will be my denomination, right? Uh, but my religion is brushing my teeth. My faith tradition is Crest. I, I'm confident that Crest will get the job done that I need to do. And everybody is excited because of that. But when we look at this in terms of how do we engage uh, uh, someone who might use AIM or baking soda or whatever, how can we all get the same results? Uh, we want our teeth clean <laughs> and the world would be better for that. And how do we allow for that uh, diversity expressions to be uh, realized in terms of our faith traditions? If, if our practice is a different sort of practice than what others see, uh, I might be a patient in a, in a Jewish hospital uh, that, that won't discriminate if I'm a Christian or if I'm Muslim but I may have to articulate that I may need this particular sort of chaplaincy to help me, or if I'm an atheist, those things are important. So we, we have to learn how to, to honor uh, those differences, and it's very important because, like I said, most recently, a lot of research has come out in terms of how, how uh, uh, religious practices and faith, especially meditation, have centered in terms of holistic care and, and, and healing and, and all of that. So that's, that's, it's quite, it's quite important. I was looking at uh, some of the things that was on the, on the board and trying to figure out where, where those uh, have resonated. And um, it's very important to know if a person has a particular uh, trajectory in terms of where they work out there. Um, uh, soul salvation, if you will. Uh, it's quite important. Let's, uh, let's move right into a broader discussion about the LGBT community. And because I don't want to assume anything, it was, uh, I'm continuing to learn. You all know I've been in business for 28 years doing this work, but I realize the more you think you know, the more you need to know. So would you just break down those terms for us, LGBTQ, and what they mean, and then maybe a broader discussion about your personal journey, uh, as much as you'd like to share, and the impact and the importance of the community, what's happening in Nebraska, what happened with the gay marriage ban, mm -hmm. and Westboro Baptist Church and, and, and the like. And uh, you know, give us examples in terms of you know, what are some of the issues on campus that you're facing. And uh, you pastor a mainstream church in Nebraska, one of the, uh, the oldest black church in Lincoln and the second oldest in, um, in Nebraska. And uh, uh, give us a sense of what it's like to be a pastor uh, that has a rainbow flag in front of the church and um, and your membership and those in leadership who guide you. So a little broad, but I just I'm throwing it at you so you can mix it up any way you like. Okay, I'll go with it on the run. So LGBTQ, L is lesbian, uh, G is gay, B is bisexual, T is transgender, not gendered, transgender, and Q is queer or questioning. Um, and and many in the LGBTQ community, and then A is for allies. Um, 
uh, many in the LGBTQ community uh, uh, now are using the queer term as an academic term, queer questioning, and ha have uh, redefined it as something that's empowering. So it's not offensive uh, in, in academic circles to use the term queer. And a lot of younger people, uh, college age and below, are claiming that particular title because it is not, they, uh, the, the binary constructs that we have in terms of uh, gender identity and sexuality is so fluid and so to uh, there there are those who might not be able to identify succinctly as being lesbian or gay because of the 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 gender fluidity uh, that takes place which which raises a, 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 a confusing question I suppose when we talk about gender fluidity and I'll just uh, throw this out as a point of conversation and then sort of weave it back in um, when we think of uh, this whole, and this is a religious sort of a spirituality uh, context as well, and I'll, since you're healthcare professionals, I want to just uh, kind of take you to a place that I hope <laughs> you've never gone before. Um, if you think about it, our, we are we are spirit before we're flesh, right? That and and then we go back to being spirit once our 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 flesh is no longer whole once we have gone back to being dust of the earth once we have decayed our spirit is what continues to live on so so as we even before we are ever the the egg or the sperm that collides to make us who we are and the x and y chromosomes we're this spiritual essence and as a spiritual being there is no gender right and in fact when when a baby is incubating uh, i think it's like the first eight weeks maybe it's all the same. Everybody looks like a little shrimp. <laughs> Most life forms start out looking exactly alike, no matter what the species. Look like a little shrimp. I'm glad she didn't put shrimp in there because we would. <laughs> so, so, so then if we if we start out in this in this world as spirit, and then we understand for for me, God is non-gendered. Uh, God is God. God is spirit. And and when God created. Uh, God created male and female simultaneously. That's the first recording of, of the original writings. That and, and, and God breathed into this, this wind, put the wind in these beings to, to make them who they are. And so as, as this wind or as, this, as these spiritual beings that, that later develop a... a, a physical identity uh, that begins to form uh, that that gives us this two-spirit nature if you will that we're, we're both we're both male and female until that division takes place but our identity no one comes out knowing what it means to be a boy or a girl you know those are social constructs those gender identities, and we, we began to construct these roles that people live into. For example, if you, if you think you're having a boy, and now we know but with ultrasounds, it's best we hope we can figure out the gender, we start decorating the nurseries with sort of blue and you know, sort of masculine as we want to have it prescribed in our, in our minds, and the same thing it is what we do with girls. And so we are, we are prescribing a role on the identity of, of a being that has no clue. <laughs> so, so our social constructs begin to have a greater reality than our core as spiritual beings. And that sets up this unbelievable contradiction. So what if I am female with the, with the anatomically correct female anatomy as it's been prescribed based on the the naming of that anatomy but what if my what if that doesn't really fit what my spiritual core is saying that I am and so this gender that I am assigned to at birth may not be what's in the spiritual core that's making my mind perceive something that it's not lining up. There's this great contradiction. And so um, 
And so today, more than ever, we have more information about this gender reassignment or, or what happens when uh, people's uh, uh, physical bodies are not lining up with what their soul is saying or what their spirit is saying. And so we go through this process of being gender reassigned or, or transitioning or transition from male to female or female to male. Um, and, and so it, it becomes an interesting uh, uh, dynamic when we, when we see uh, what goes on, you know, how, how can that be? And then if, if I have been, uh, uh, have, if I've gone through a gender reassignment and um, how, how is my health care realized? Where is that on the questionnaire? Because on the questionnaire that we fill out, male or female, and how if I have become a transgender person, where do I mark? And how, how as a health professional will you work with me? Because now my physical, uh, uh, the anatomically correct uh, parts have been attached, but I'm still on the inside, my entrails might still be male or, or female. And so that's, a, that's an interesting um, phenomenon that, that uh, many transgender people are dealing with. Um, and, and, and the most marginalized group within the LGBTQ community, I say, are the transgender women. And when I say transgender women, these are men who have transitioned to be women. Uh, and, and 